Hello everyone, Santier here. And uh, Redcoat's here as well. And today we've got another podcast for ya. And uh, this one's all about character progression. As a brief start out, the character progression is the idea of as you go through a game, your character or your player avatar is going to gain more capabilities. And this shouldn't be confused with the advancement of player skill. Rather, player skill determines how well a player will use the capabilities that this character possesses. What we're talking about here is focusing on the mechanics of leveling up, so to speak. Yeah, sort of the mechanics of character progression, not the, the Narvazad of it. So for those of you who skipped podcast, whatever number it was, where we talked about Narvazad briefly, that is the narrative, visual, and audio idea of the composite experience of video games. Yep. So it covers the non-mechanical aspect of things, and that's things like what do things look like, what sort of sound are you using, what's the story, what's the lore. Not that those things are not important, uh, just the way that that plays out in advancement tends to... Uh, they, they tend to accentuate. They don't necessarily, yeah. um, they don't necessarily define. The accentuate or explain. Define. Like in Pokemon, you have evolution. Yeah. Right? And that's an explanation for why the Pokemon is getting a form change with more powers or whatever. Yeah, and I mean, the, like the Narvazod of it, it's very, it's, it has a very iconic Narvazod, but the actual mechanical implications of that uh, do a lot more to your gameplay. Yeah. So typically, there are three things that are used as character progression, just broadly speaking. Uh, so increasing statistics, most games use statistics or stats as they usually get referred to as. So things like maximum health, that's a very common one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that often these increase over the course of a game. Uh, you don't necessarily have to increase them, but they often do. Mm -hmm. uh, so that would be a way of doing character progression. New skills. So this is a very broad concept, but it's sort of what can the character do? Mm -hmm. uh, and these will often be increased over time, like uh, uh, some sort of game where you're like, oh, and now I got points and I can buy myself a new move. Like Shadow of Mordor does this. Yeah, Shadow of Mordor does that. Um, I mean, uh, Devil May Cry does that a lot. Devil May Cry does that also. Advance your skill trees, whatever. Or increased options. This is actually a, another way of doing character progression. The idea here is not that you just add another thing that the player can do, but that you make the player sort of choose what thing they're doing. So this is not choosing like, oh, you get to pick one of these two new skills. This is saying, for example, in like a Souls game where you pick up another sword yeah. or a spear and you're like, okay, so now I have the weapon that I already had and I have this as another option. I can't use both at the same time or you, you might want to and then you're like foregoing a shield or something. Yeah. Right, so you're having to pick what combination of things you're using, so you adding options onto that is another form of character progression. That's a very interesting way of not increasing the player's power so much as it is increasing allowing them to be more strategic. Yeah, more more versatility, as uh, Redcoat was saying. Yeah, it's a very interesting way of getting the player to feel a little bit stronger, but in the sense of just, I can deal with more situations. Yeah, so there's uh, a note that we can make here that character regression is a, is a complementary concept here. It can potentially be interesting. You can do things like, say, decreasing options, take a player's stuff away. A mm -hmm. uh, really good example of where they actually apply this is in Metroid games. Yeah. Where at the start, you're like, oh man, I have all of these missiles and morph ball and whatever else. Yeah, they give you a taste of what it's like to have everything. And then they take it away. Um, so it can it can be interesting, but you have to handle it kind of carefully uh, because it's very easy to frustrate the player, especially if you're taking away something that the player feels like they've put a lot of time into getting. Yeah, it's very it's very important that character regression is handled with with utmost care and done in such a way of where it makes absolute sense and it doesn't explicitly disenfranchise the player. Yeah, so it's now important to talk about the concept of what sort of things trigger character progression? So we have the very obvious one that I'm certain most of you have already thought of, which is leveling up. And uh, this is a very commonly used one, just the idea that uh, your character has a number that indicates their level, and with each level, their 
uh, there follows an increase in stats, uh, and some of the levels will add new skills. Yeah, this is a fairly basic, commonly done way. There's also this concept of form change. I kind of talked about this a little bit earlier with something like Pokemon Evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, and the idea with this is it's often used as kind of a sign or marker of significant progress, but it typically comes with an increase in things like skills or stats or the promise of new options like you take an Eevee and you give it a Thunderstone and now it's a Jolteon and oh man, what sort of things is it going to learn now? Yeah. Or uh, like, you... well, thinking of a uh, um, another game actually that has mm -hmm. something mm -hmm. like this, uh, it was Mega Man Battle Network. Mm, okay. Uh, in that game, as you went through it, the game actually watched how you played and after a certain point, you gain a new form in the form of either like you'd be a grass navi or a uh, navi is what your character is. It's a right, not, not an annoying fairy in this yes, case. Yes, yes. Uh, an unfortunate name, honestly. But you become a grass one, or you'd become a wa uh, a water navi or a fire navi based on what kind of attacks you use throughout the game, and these would give you new abilities based on that new form. Sure, that's that's a very good example. Quests is another uh, way. Quest rewards can include things that increase your character progression, things like new skills or permanent stat boosts, stuff like that. Equipment is a significant one. So mm -hmm. this is something that kind of at first blush, it seems kind of like a, a sort of character progression. Typically, it seems that way because it's a combination of stats and skills. Uh, I think in something like a Souls game, because it comes with its own functionality, mm -hmm. it more works as an additional option. But in a lot of games, uh, like a lot of RPGs, like a Tales game, mm -hmm. what, say, set of dual swords Lloyd has equipped doesn't really influence what skills he can use. Yeah. It just allows him to use them better. Yeah, although the other concept there is things like the Metroid games or any upgrade hunter. Your equipment is very, very much a part of your character progression. Yeah, and that I'd agree very much so, because it's it really is... I mean, it's in many ways, it's a new skill that's the character progression, and the equipment is the representative of that. Yes. So that's kind of like, it looks like it, but it's because of the things that it opens up to you versus being the equipment itself that's the character progression. True, true. Um things like plot progression you'll have story moments where it just awards you with stuff like oh man your grandfather died and now you suddenly get his sword in the middle of a quest or something i can think of a specific example of this in tales of symphonia where you hit a plot point where uh the main character lloyd is given a special sword that is uh, like a fire sword and a an ice sword that he dual wields those that he gets from some plot significant characters mm -hmm. um stuff like that can result in things that result in character progression yeah and uh, there are plenty of other things i mean as um as we are wont to say not an exhaustive list but we've hit a fairly broad list of them yeah here. those tend to be the major ones and i also want to stress that a lot of the terms we're using here are fairly broad because we want to have them be applicable to as many different games as possible so the concept of what character progression looks like in say god of war and pokemon we can apply similar terms yes yes and so a it here i feel like you had a um you had a concept or rather a claim i suppose yeah i have a, a big claim that i want to make which is that increased stats are pretty boring as far as character progression goes it's in particular when that's really all that they do like they they definitely are character progression they they increase usually like how much damage you can take or how much damage you deal but for most games, they don't really change the way you play. They don't really mean anything of them in and of themselves. Mm -hmm. When I think about Pokemon, a level isn't exciting because I got better stats unless it means that I hit some sort of breakpoint in speed tiers for competitive Pokemon or something, and that's based on the Pokemon, not the level. Yeah. Like, the stats by themselves just getting more is just... It doesn't mean anything. It's, when do I get a new move? Yeah. When do I evolve? Yeah. Those are the things that really keep me going forward in, in say, leveling in Pokemon. Mm -hmm. And not, oh man, I'm going to get more stats. Yeah, because the, the thing is that the stats in of themselves, unless they do something significant to the way your the mechanics of the game interact... Well, in a lot of ways, I don't see them as reward enough in of themselves. Gaining an additional functionality or gaining something that 
just looks different um, in of itself. Like looking at Pokemon Evolution, this is a combination of things. It's gaining new options um, because you have a whole new set of moves that you may have you may have access to once you evolve the Pokemon. Um, you gain a new look to your Pokemon, which is a Narvazod reward, but it's not necessarily progression. Right, but it's a very it's a very tangible thing. It, it gives a very tangible sense of my Pokemon's getting stronger. Like Charmeleon feels more awesome than Charmander does. Or at least he feels stronger. Some yeah. people would say he's... Some people would say Charmander is the most awesome. Uh, I'm not one of those people, though, actually. I, I, <laughs> it, math says otherwise, but like, <laughs> you are allowed to think I like how Charmander looks more than I like how Charmeleon looks, and that's perfectly valid. Yes, aesthetically, he looks interesting, but Charmeleon is the stronger of the two. For sure. And it really puts a cap on that. Like... Mm -hmm. Feather, feather goes in. Calls yeah. it, calls it macaroni, mm -hmm. uh, which I learned recently is about clothing styles. Huh. Yeah. We'll have um, to talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, yeah. And and the other thing that might happen is your types might change. You mm -hmm. evolve into Charizard, and all of a sudden you're part flying now, and you don't have to worry about those earthquakes anymore. Yeah, you have to worry about other things, but that's for another podcast. <laughs> oh yes, it is <laughs> extensively. <laughs> But again, the rewarding part of leveling up in Pokemon is not that you're gaining more stats and you're statting more stats. It's that you're getting closer to certain goals. Yeah, and that's that's often the case in a lot of games. Uh, I can think about, for example, job mastery systems, mm -hmm. where it's it's new skills that you get, but really, one of the things that's most exciting is when you master a job and you can move on to mastering the next one. Yeah. It's a sense of accomplishment of, yes, I've got this thing done now. Yeah, in a way, the, the idea of having stats slowly but surely accumulate over time um, is basically simulating what it's like to train up a skill right yeah when like say when you're doing sword fighting and there's a weapon that you really want to use but when you go to swing it you can only swing it like two times and then your form is just completely messed up uh, and you're like oh man i'm not strong enough to do this so you spend some time doing other things to get the arm strength and the upper body strength to actually swing this weapon more uh, more consistently and with, I won't say perfect form, but good form. That's what stat progression is simulating. Yeah, it makes me think a little bit of Skyrim, where you swing your sword and you get better at sword swinging, and once you get better enough at sword swinging, it lets you buy a perk. Mm -hmm. It's about the perk. It's not about each individual level of sword swinging, even if that does have some benefit. Yeah. Um, now, I... I think that stats can be done in an interesting way. Dark Souls proves this. Yeah. But the thing is, the stats in that game are not an end in and to themselves. It's a way of allowing you access to equipment. Mm -hmm. Like, when I think about in, in Dark Souls 1, not Dark Souls 1, but first point, you're not restricted to one level at a time. Mm -hmm. You can buy as many as you have the souls to buy. Mm. So it's this feeling of like, okay, I get all these things. The other, next thing is that the game's character progression is focused on equipping new weapons. Mm. You don't need levels to beat the game. Uh, many, many people will beat the game without levels. Not most players, but mm -hmm. you have... The, you have those guys who are just really good at the you game. You have a sizable percentage of the population that does like soul level 1 or base level playthroughs. Mm -hmm. So the idea of getting levels, therefore, it tends to be more about like getting builds or things like that of like, oh, I want to be able to wield a Zweihander one-handed. Well, I need so much strength. Uh, it depends upon which game you're playing. Yep. Um, and so it does a really good job of, it has levels and stats, but its emphasis is on how those serve other forms of progression, like how getting more stats opens up your options. Yeah. And things like that. They also, uh, one thing that, that I really like about what Dark Souls does is it places a bit more of an emphasis on leveling up your weapons. So it gives this other sense of progression outside of that, as well as like finding new armor to wear and things like that. And it overall, it makes meaning there. The other thing that's really meaningful though is each level is a stat. One mm -hmm. point and one stat. So you feel like you're making a meaningful decision every time you level up. And you feel like I am directing this character towards something. Yes. And it's not just arbitrarily getting levels. And that's kind of one of the things that I think is an important concept here 
uh, that will. Uh, we're going to look at a couple of other notable games and, and how and how they handle this character progression idea. We've talked about Pokemon a bunch, and uh, there's there's a couple other points that we want to hit there in a moment. But just keep in mind this idea of player decision, and I want to say like not temporally regulated character mm-hmm. progression. Mm-hmm. So when we look at something like Pokemon. We talked a lot about how the leveling and evolution works, but one of the other things that's important to look at is you're playing the trainer, not the Pokemon. Yeah. You have this idea of getting more Pokemon. That's exciting. That's a form of character progression. It opens up options. Yeah, yeah. There's this idea of TMs that Mm -hmm. allow you to be able to teach moves. Technical machines is what this stands for. Uh, That allows you to teach moves to Pokemon outside of like the normal leveling system. And gaining those grants you more options with all of those Pokemons, and so that's Mm -hmm. another form of progression in and of itself. Yeah, you get a TM, you're like, oh man, this move sounds awesome, which of my Pokemon can learn it? Because you just picked up Earthquake and not, say, Steamroller. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Yeah, that move. Uh, Yeah. Um, Or, you know, you got Flamethrower instead of something like Incinerate. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and the other thing is that you have different Pokemon that grow at different rates. It's like how much experience does each one need is one thing, which Pokemon do need different levels of experience to, to gain, different amounts of experience to gain levels. Overloading words too much there. But you have like six different Pokemon with you and they evolve at different levels. They learn moves at different levels. So you get this sort of different rhythm yeah. of things that you're building towards. And TMs help break the sort of level only progression aspect of things. Getting new Pokemon breaks that. Yeah. So you have all of these things that really make the progression feel more interesting. Yeah, it's it's not one note. There's just there's a lot of different aspects that go into becoming a master trainer. Absolutely. That's something that will make a level well not a level progression, but a character progression affecting. Talking a little bit about character progression, Devil May Cry has a system that works a little bit differently than you uh, than some others, where instead of you just as you do stuff, you gain more stats, you're actually basically collecting what would uh, be considered your experience points in the form of red orbs. Every time you kill an enemy, they drop orbs, and you're just like, ah, eat those orbs. Well, not eat them, but you pick them up. Shuck these into your body, mm. and now I have them. I have the orbs, Trebek. <laughs> anyway, you take the orbs and then you use them to buy new skill. Each skill you buy um, will open up other skills. So say uh, in Devil May Cry, the, the character progression is basically twofold. It's as you go through the game and fight different bosses, the bosses die and they become the weapons that you use. And those weapons have skills on them that you can buy with the red orbs that you get from killing other enemies. And so as the game goes along, you get rewarded for just moving through it by getting those items. And your character is immediately progressed in that he has way more options. And you can just put another item on him and just start learning how to use it. Um, But on top of that, you have the red orbs, which when you spend them and gain a new skill, that weapon gets progressed which in turn progresses your character and gives you, we'll say, an additional strength in fighting in the style that the weapon grants you. So basically your character progression is gaining new styles of combat through weapons and then making those styles of combat better by buying new abilities. Yeah, it's a, an interesting way of doing it too, mm-hmm. uh, because it's not arbitrarily marking off levels. Yeah, and it's very player influenced. It's something where yeah, it gives you a lot of choice. Yeah, one of the things I really loved about the the Devil May Cry series is just that idea that a lot of people play the games very differently, and uh, the the way they do their progression helps you personalize your playstyle. Yeah, for sure. Another game actually with about personalizing playstyles is Guild Wars 1. Uh, so this is a game that, and, and particularly what I'm going to be getting into here, I'll get into a great deal more detail in a, a future podcast that mm-hmm. will be coming up within the next couple of months, but it's this idea of how that build system is set up and what they did for their character progression. So the game itself doesn't have very many levels, uh, particularly in the realm of... It wasn't quite a full-on MMO because all of the combat areas were instanced, but it was an online-only game, or or is. Um, And it doesn't have very many levels. It only has 20. And sort of the later campaigns were built with the idea that the game starts at level 20. Mm -hmm. The tutorial gets you more or less... If you're, if you're doing stuff thoroughly enough, you'll get to you to level 20. 
most of the time it's really difficult to exit those before you're like at least level 16 or 17. Mm -hmm. And what levels would get you in that game were attribute points. And attribute points you spec into your different stat lines. Again, if you don't know what I'm talking about, uh, you can ask in comments, but uh, you can also just wait uh, for like next month. Ish, yeah. Ish, something like that, because yeah. you're going to get into the build system in way more detail then. But these stat points were something that they give you options in how you're going to put your character get together. So as you get levels, you get more uh, attribute points that allow you to have more options in how you're going to build your character. But the main form of progression in that game, uh, character progression-wise, was buying skills. So once you hit level 20, experience still did something for you. Mm -hmm. uh, every like 15,000 experience or whatever, the numbers are relevant you would get a skill point. Mm. And skills cost some amount of money and a skill point to purchase. Mm. And you could get every single skill in the game on any given character mm. because of the way that it worked with primary and secondary professions. The idea here, though, is when you first make a character, you're locked into one secondary profession and you unlock the ability to get more later. So that's a form of progression. It gives you options of what you're... Uh, second profession skills you're going to have access to by what second profession you have. But the the main goal here was getting skills. Skills were what it was all about. Generally, that was increasing your options of what you could do. So you could do more roles, do more different types of things. And they had a few different ways that you could acquire them. Some skills you could get through quests. Uh, that was more prevalent in uh, the very first Guild Wars game, Guild Wars Prophecies. But that was a way that you could get them. You could also buy them from trainers, though generally trainers, they don't have all skills available, mm -hmm. uh, particularly when you first start the game, because uh, they they made it so that way they would have all skills that you have unlocked on your account available, mm -hmm. but you were basically, you got more and more skills available as you went through and found new trainers. And one of the other big ideas was this concept of capturing skills off of bosses. Mm -hmm. So you could find a, an enemy, boss was kind of loose term, but they had kind of an aura about them for the profession they had skills of. And when you killed them, you could use an item called a signet of capture. So mm -hmm. it was actually a skill that you brought on your bar. Yeah. So you had to handicap yourself because you only could bring eight skills at a time. And so you'd handicap yourself by bringing a signet of capture. You'd beat this boss character, you'd use the signet of capture, and then you can pick any skill that they have. And then the signet of capture permanently turns into that skill, or any skill that you also don't already have a copy of anyway. You mm. can't duplicate skills. Uh, but one of the things that was really significant was that that was the only way to get a certain class of skills called elite skills. You can only have one on your bar. So getting a new elite skill could open up a lot of opportunities because elite skills did a lot of powerful things. Mm. They served in the role of multiple skills at once, so you could have one elite skill filling the role of multiple normal skills and gain access to more open slots for other skills. Um, there were more powerful versions of existing skills. Uh, they were just powerful, unique effects, like all sorts of different things there. Some of them were built around me. So they had a lot of really neat things there. And this sort of quest to go off and find bosses gave a very active sense of character progression. You're like, okay, I'm going to go hunt down this boss so I can buy the skill and make this build that I want to make. Yeah. And it was this very sort of active sense, almost kind of like um, in a trading card game, going down and hunting down that specific card that you need to complete your deck. Yeah. It's interesting because it reminds me a little bit of some of the stuff that happens in Monster Hunter um, where by hunting down different monsters you get materials that you can use to make better weapons or new weapons and things along those lines. Yeah, kind of a similar concept, right? Those are both ways of doing character progression. But the thing that, that makes things interesting, I think, in, in a lot of these examples is where we look at the player having meaningful choices to make. Yes. Where it feels like character progression is not just, oh, my character are arbitrarily stronger, but they got stronger in a way where I had some agency about it. Yeah. Or where it changes how I'm interacting with the game. Yeah, it's it's either that it grants you it grants you a certain sense of agency and a certain sense of just making allowing you to make the character better, so to speak. Or, as Santer stated, it changes the way that you're interacting with the game. It makes you play the game differently. Um, if it doesn't really change the way that you're playing the game, then does the level really mean anything? Yeah, and actually something I just thought of, like right now on the spot, that's really significant about Pokemon, is the four move limit. Yeah, because that means that, because it's interesting because if you just wanted it to be just epic reward forever and you just keep getting another option, another option, another option, and your list just goes on forever, 
it makes the levels less poignant, and it means that you're less unique, so to speak. Yeah. Well, and that's kind of kind of what my thought was, right? When I was thinking about it, is like, oh, with Pokemon, if getting a new level or like a level that gives you a skill mm-hmm. didn't make you have to pick whether or not you wanted that skill, it wouldn't give you that sense of agency at that moment. Mm-hmm. It's a meaningful choice. What skill do I do I want to keep this skill? Do I want to overwrite a skill? With a TM, it gives you a choice of whether or not you want to use it. Mm-hmm. Imagine if they had no skill cap in Pokemon, no move mm-hmm. limit. You would look at your Pokemon and you're like, I have Absorb and Mega Drain and Giga Drain and Energy Ball and Earthquake. And like, I don't know, this is a Torterra or something. Power Whip, yeah. uh, Wood Hammers. Like, I have all of these moves and it, it removes that sense of like, agency about how you're building that Pokemon. It removes that sense of investment mm-hmm. to not have that limit. And I think that that sort of limit, it, it again emphasizes this sense of like investment that these these levels, this moves set that you've selected is meaningful to you because you have chosen to have it. Yeah, you've chosen it and you have chosen not to use others. Yeah. Um, and that is that is a key part of that. And it's actually it actually hits on one particular point of uh, just design in general, which is your limitations do just as much as what you enable to change the experience. Yeah, and giving the player the option of what to use. Like think about with Dark Souls where you have to make meaningful decisions about what weapons you're gonna wield, what weapons are you gonna put resources into upgrading. Mm-hmm. Right? It's a meaningful decision about your character's progression. Yeah. Well, I feel that we've hit this subject pretty well. I think so. I think we've we've covered it pretty thoroughly. And uh, I think we also emphasize the point that character progression by itself, there, there needs to be a sense of meaning to it that the player feels like they're making a choice about how that progression happens for sort of a certain level of investment to occur. Yeah, after a fashion, character progression shouldn't just be math. Character progression should be algebra, where the numbers actually represent something, and there is a result that comes out of their interaction. It's a little bit weird, but... (laughs) Yeah, it's interesting to think about. I would like to see more games where it doesn't just feel like a level just means my numbers went up. Like, at least do something like Fire Emblem, where you have growths. Yeah. And you can be like, oh man, is this character going to develop in the way that I want them to? Yeah, and those are all... It's just, you make it interesting, you make it a non-trivial interaction, um, and something that really, that informs the play of the game. Yeah. At any rate, we've gone on long enough on this one, I think. I think so. So this is Santier, signing off. And this is Redco, signing off. Play the games you want to play, boyos.